Imagine a cold, wintry Canadian day, and the phone rings, and they tell you you have your dream job. Well, I was thrilled to learn that I would be the chief executive officer of Juul, the Canadian Medical Association's newest subsidiary. The Canadian Medical Association is 150 years old, with over 83,000 members, and they created Juul. They had the innovation to say, we need to identify, aggregate, curate, and procure products that really help with quality of care of physicians. So many of you are probably scratching your heads and saying, dream job, it's a new job, of course. But in actual reality, it's a culmination of my career. It's the culmination of me leading patient organizations and later on my career working with physicians. And whether you were a patient with hemophilia, ALS, or Crohn's and colitis, every day they had to struggle with the complexity of our healthcare system. And later, in working with physicians, I saw the frustration in physicians' face of the inefficiencies of the system. So one year ago, I began my journey to set up a vibrant entrepreneurial organization. An organization that would create disruption, drive change, and create a movement for physician-led innovation. And just one month ago, I had the great privilege to launch Juul. Juul is a unit of energy, and energy is, is in our culture. It's what our organization wants to be. And we want to create radical disruption to allow physicians to bring the changes they need to the system and bring game-changing products. So I asked our Juul team to set up an innovation platform. And what they did <clears throat> is set up a platform where it brings, allows physicians to bring big ideas to life and have the grit and tenacity to bring game-changing products to the market. So we're not business as usual. We're business as unusual. We're a lean startup. We use lean methodologies to develop our products and services. We're going to engage our physicians differently in terms of using Hacking Health and partnering with Hacking Health. And we set up an innovation council of 12 young entrepreneurs who have ridden that roller coaster of challenges and successes and brought real game-changing products to market. And we've set up an innovation grant program that allows physicians to have seed money to build on their small eye innovation or their big eye innovation. So we're really excited by that, but also we foster physician leadership. And I know in Canada and many other countries, Canadians are looking for our physician to take leadership in our healthcare system. Who better to know the problems at the system level than those that are dealing with them and those that have great solutions? And so that's why we're there. We're only one month in, so I don't have an example to give you, but I will say we're a startup with plans to finish up. So here's what we're thinking. Imagine products and services available to Canadian physicians that allow them to be the physician they want to be to allow them to provide quality care to their patients, that turns our healthcare system upside down, that eradicates challenges like the growth in medical knowledge. Did you know that the growth in medical knowledge will double by 73 days, every 73 days by the time we get to 2020? So this is not far-fetched. So now what I want to do is turn it over to Dr. Jishan Chowdhury, who's an innovator, he's a co-founder of Hacking Health, and he's on our Innovation Council to share his view as a physician in terms of Juul. Thank you very much, Lindy. So I want to begin by asking you guys a question. What is the first word that comes to your mind when you think about healthcare? And in particular, innovation in healthcare. Now I think some of you will be having some exciting words in your mind like big data, or artificial intelligence, or quantify itself. But when I think about healthcare innovation, and I've been a doctor training on the wards, a researcher at a university, and now an entrepreneur in digital health, the word that comes to my mind when I think about healthcare innovation is no. As a doctor, you hear no all the time. No, you can't email your patients. No, 
you still have to use the fax machine. No, we can't get rid of pagers. And it's the same thing for our patients. No, you still don't have access to your records online. No, you can't message your doctor. And perhaps this culture of no comes from the fact that we're more in the business of saying no to death than we are saying yes to living. But this culture of death, sorry, this culture of no uh, has been very difficult for me because before being in the hospital, I'd been in cultures of yes. I'd been a researcher at NASA looking how we can send men to Mars, humans to Mars.、Um, I had been in Silicon Valley trying to do a startup. And it was there that I went to my first hackathon, where coders and designers pitch projects. And what amazed me about the hackathon was that it was a place where no did not exist. No was replaced with why not. And when I came back to the hospital, I thought to myself, could we do a hackathon in a hospital? But instead of having designers and coders pitch projects on software, could patients and providers pitch ideas on their experience? Could we create an island of yes in an ocean of no's? We've done over 50 of these hackathons all over the world, and at each one, we've learned some important lessons. And through Hacking Health and Jewel, we've become in the business of saying, how do we create spaces for yes in healthcare? And there's two things that I want to share with you from from all that we've learned. The first. Is that there needs to be spaces for people to say yes, especially in places like hospital, where you're drowned out by an ocean of no's. However small they may be, they need to exist because the people are there. We've had 50 of these hackathons, and at each one, the local host doubts whether there'll be enough doctors, enough patients who will give up their time to come. We have never had a single hackathon where we've had enough space for a patient or provider to come and show us their idea. The second thing is that for those of us who want to see change, we need to feel like we're not alone. We need to hear yes from just one other person, however, however small that may be. Now, those may seem like two very simple, obvious lessons, but they're critical. And I want to leave you with a quote. And I didn't fully understand it until now. And it's a poem from Stephen Wallace, where he says. After the final no, there comes a yes, and on that yes depends the future of the world. So our call to action to you is: How can we learn to say yes? And more importantly, how can we create a space for yes for the people around us? Thank you. Thank you.